Hello, and welcome to Decision Points, the story of key moments in the history of the U.S.-Israel relationship. My name is David Murkowski, the Ziegler Distinguished Fellow at the Washington Institute and Director of the Project on Arab-Israel Relations, and I'm excited to go on this journey through history with you. On today's episode, we will discuss the 1973 war, known as the Yom Kippur War in Israel and the October or Ramadan War in Egypt. The war came as a shock to both Israel and the United States. It was enmeshed in an era of detente, or a cooling of tensions, between the U.S. and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. On October 6, 1973, most Israelis were in synagogues and away from military posts, observing Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the Jewish year. At the same time, Egyptian and Syrian brigades began moving across the Suez Canal in the south and into the Golan Heights in the north, beginning a surprise dual invasion of Israel. Israel began calling up and deploying its enlisted and reserve officers in order to push back the invading forces. However, Israel was not prepared for a full-scale war. Both Israeli generals and American diplomats thought this would be a quick war, similar to 1967, but they did not count on Egypt's Soviet supplies, SAM anti-aircraft missile units, which the Israelis were not capable of defeating. Israeli planes were being shot down flying over the Suez Canal. Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir was prepared to fly secretly to Washington, D.C. to ask President Richard Nixon for military help to counter the SAMs. Kissinger refused, saying there was no need, as there was nothing that they could give her in Washington they couldn't give her in Jerusalem. Kissinger was trying to avoid a confrontation with Israel over military aid. As the war progressed, Kissinger grew to think there could be some post-war advantages for the U.S. Maybe this was an opening for diplomatic negotiations. However, the Israelis feared this would put them at a diplomatic disadvantage. In general, Kissinger wanted to resolve the war with diplomacy. He wanted to keep the U.S. and the Soviet Union out and avoid engaging deeply with either side in order not to ruin the detente between the two superpowers. Thanks to an Egyptian-backed channel, Kissinger believed Egypt only wanted to cross the Suez Canal in order to take back both banks of the waterway and reopen commercial travel. Moshe Dayan, Israel's iconic defense minister and war hero, feared Egypt sought the end of the, quote, Third Commonwealth, end quote, a reference to historic periods of Jewish sovereignty more than two millennia ago. In other words, Dayan thought Egypt did not just want to cross the canal, but even possibly destroy Israel. There were these developments in the Middle East war today. The Soviet Union, according to Washington sources, has started an airlift to resupply Egypt and Syria. The State Department issued a public warning to the Russians saying their action could hurt U.S.-Soviet relations. At the same time, the U.S. reportedly has started sending some arms to Israel. The Egyptians rejected a U.N. ceasefire a week after the war began, having already crossed the canal. And the U.S. learned that a massive Soviet military airlift was heading to Cairo in only 36 hours. And this would carry the Arabs to a major victory. Most importantly, the Arabs beating the Israelis would be interpreted as Soviet weaponry beating American weaponry. As transcripts of conversation between Kissinger and Nixon show, both were not against an Israel-Arab stalemate, but the Soviet airlift shifted the U.S. calculus. Kissinger would now dramatically shift gears. On October 14th, eight days into the war, the U.S. began a strategic airlift of supplies to Israel. Two weeks into the war, Nixon requested $2.2 billion from Congress in military aid. The airlift played a role in reversing the course of the war, which saw Israel positioned on the western bank of the Suez Canal by October 16th and within 10 miles of Damascus on October 20th, as well as encircling the massive Egyptian Third Army in the Sinai. I recently discussed the 1973 war with Martin Indyk. He worked in several U.S. administrations on Israeli-Palestinian peace negotiations, including as the U.S. Special Envoy on peace negotiations from 2013 to 2014. I should disclose that I was a senior advisor to Martin during this time. He has written extensively on the history of the U.S.-Israel relationship. He is currently a distinguished fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. He is working on a book entitled 
Henry Kissinger and the Art of the Middle East Deal. It was a pleasure to talk to Martin. I hope you all enjoy the interview. Martin, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, David. Pleasure to be with you. So the U.S. airlift of, of military weaponry to Israel seemed to change the course of the war. Can you first give us a sense just of the drama of the moment? Well, the drama was exacerbated by the sense that Israelis had of their world turned upside down. They had gone into the war assuming that they would have a quick victory because they saw themselves as the kind of great power of the Middle East after the 67 Six-Day War. They did not expect that any Arab country would dare to attack them because they assumed that they would immediately defeat them. And yet, as a result of the surprise attack, coordinated attack by Syria in Egypt on October 6th, Yom Kippur, 1973, the Syrians were able to advance to the edge of the Golan and almost coming down to Israeli settlements in the valley. And the Egyptians crossed the canal and took the entire Israeli positions along the east bank of the canal. So there was a lot of lack of information for the first few days including, by the way, the Israeli government not <coughs> informing the U.S. government of what exactly was going on. It wasn't until, I think, day three that Kissinger discovered through briefings from Dinitz, uh, Simcha Dinitz, who was the, US, uh, the Israeli ambassador in Washington, that, in fact, they had faced a disaster. There was not going to be a quick victory for Israel. And so all of the expectations and assumptions had gone out the window. Diane, in his melancholy mood, as you said, thought this was the end of Israel. But certainly there was this kind of traumatic sense that Israel was in real trouble. Now, in fact, the Israeli armed forces didn't need a massive military resupply to prosecute the war at that stage. The Air Force needed some aircraft replacement because they'd suffered badly from these SAM missile attacks that you mentioned. But there was no immediate shortage. What the massive airlift from the United States did was give the Israelis a shot in the arm, a critical sense that the United States was behind them four square, that they could move against the Egyptian and Syrian armies in counteroffensives and not have to worry about running out of supplies not only for this war, the chief of staff at the time, Dado Eloza, was much more concerned about the sense that now they were going to have kind of never-ending wars. And military resupply was critical for what he was thinking about was the next war they were going to have to fight. So the immediate effect of the resupply was to give the Israelis the confidence they needed to go on the offensive. It was not so critical to the actual means on the ground to prosecute that offense. And it's important because the Egyptians have this conspiracy theory that they believe to this day that it was the American resupply that saved Israel. No, it was the IDF that saved Israel. But the psychological boost that came from this massive airlift with these huge C-5A transport aircraft that were carrying tanks into Israel and flying in at night and the Israelis could hear them coming in to the various airports and air bases around Israel, could see them in the morning unloading the tanks and aircraft and spare parts and so on. And it was a critical psychological boost at a time when Israel felt isolated, under siege, and worried about its future. Didn't Sadat kick it away in a certain way? I mean, like, when I was reading Kissinger's book about the transcripts, uh, talking about two crises. Mm. It was Vietnam was going on then. I mean, sometimes in the public mind, there's like good cop, bad cop that Nixon wanted to resupply, but somehow Kissinger didn't. But when I read the transcripts of the Nixon-Kissinger conversation, it seemed like they both had a common view that uh, Israel was ahead at a certain point on the Golan, maybe behind in Sinai. They locked in a ceasefire. Okay, so Egypt got a limited advantage there. But it, then the post-war diplomacy would start at a different place. But when I read the transcripts, my takeaway was very much that Nixon and Kissinger were at the same place in their thinking. Of course, you could say Nixon was distracted by Watergate, of course. But they were both conceptually at the same place. But Sadat 
believing he had the Soviet airlift en route, you know, why stop now with the Soviet airlift? You, you know, the terms could only get better because you'd get this 36 hour in, was coming, this massive shot in the arm on his side. You know, it seemed that if Sadat would have played his cards better, the war would have ended with him on the other, you know, on the Israel side of the canal, so to speak. But then once Sadat kind of kicked it away, it seemed that both Kissinger and Nixon were at the same place, like, now turn it on. We're not going to let the Soviet weaponry be seen as the source of any sort of limited Egyptian victory. And they tried restraint because of detente. They were very mindful of the Cold War overlay of keeping the superpowers out. But the Soviets exploited it. I was reading even a transcript of Kissinger yelling at, I mean, although it's reading, so I can't hear the tone of his voice, <laughs> but you got a sense of what he was saying. Yeah. You know, you tricked us, Dobrina, and we wanted to stay out. You would have stayed out. But you, as soon as you went in, we had to go in. Mm. So, I mean, it's just fascinating, the game of chess that's yeah. going on and the interplay. This is the first Mideast war kind of under the rubric of detente and how the relationship between the superpowers and the regional players and how that interfaces. Yeah. Well, it's a complicated story. And the controversy rages to this day right. with some in Israel arguing that Kissinger withheld arms supplies to uh, get Israel to accept a ceasefire that was disadvantageous to Israel at that moment when it was about to strangulate the uh, Egyptian Third Army, which it had surrounded. Mm -hmm. But the story itself is a little different even to what you portrayed. Mm -hmm. First of all, I think it's important to understand that Kissinger, like the Israeli government and the CIA, all believed that the Arabs would not attack. When they did attack, the prevailing assumption amongst all these players was that Israel would quickly defeat the Arabs. So there was not, at that point, any need to worry about a massive resupply. When the Israelis came in, they didn't ask for a lot. They needed some aircraft replacement and some spare parts. And Kissinger got Nixon to agree that whatever Israel lost would be replaced. They never said immediately. They just gave them the kind of guarantee that they didn't have to worry about expending their material because they would get it all replaced. And that was the first move that was made by Kissinger. Then when he discovered that it had gone badly and that Israel had lost a lot of tanks and a lot of aircraft and a lot of ground, he began to worry that this would be a defeat for American arms by Soviet-backed uh, Arab armies. And that was something that he could not countenance, especially when the Russians launched their airlift. And so then it became a question of, well, now we have to respond to that. But in responding in the first instance, Kissinger was concerned about the potential for the Arabs to react by imposing an Arab oil embargo. And that was not an unreasonable concern yeah, since that's exactly what they did. And that had profound implications for the United States, for the American economy, for the world economy, as it turned out, more because of the rise in, in oil prices that they tacked on to the embargo. But nevertheless, it, it was all tied up. So he wanted the resupply to take place, but for it to be done under the radar. Israeli planes could come in and pick up supplies, but they had to cover over their, their markings. Then there was to be commercial American flights commandeered to, to provide that. But the Pentagon was dragging its feet. It had, at that point, did not want to get involved in a resupply of Israel, again, out of concern for the Arab reaction. And at that point, the Israelis became somewhat desperate the Congress came into it, did its mobilized support on the Hill, particularly from Senator Scoop Jackson. So there was criticism from the Hill. And it looked like the Russians were stealing a march on the United States. So at that point, Kissinger and Schlesinger basically decided, well, we better do something more. Now, here comes the most interesting dimension of this. What got Kissinger really going at that moment was that he was trying this very delicate dance in which, on the one hand, he wanted Israel to have the military equipment, but not to provoke an Arab oil embargo. But on the other hand, he needed the Israelis to be pressing the Syrians and the Egyptians militarily in order to lubricate his efforts to get a ceasefire. 
he wanted Israeli military pressure. And the Israelis were moving on the Golan, and he was telling the Israelis, go for it. Go to Damascus. He was pushing them to move. And the Israeli tanks up there started a move towards Damascus. And suddenly, they saw these cloud dusts on their right flank. An Iraqi tank division was coming towards them on their right flank. And so they had to halt their advance on Damascus and turn to deal with the threat from the Iraqi tank division. And that slowed their attack. Dinitz, very cleverly, went into Kissinger and said, we've had to slow our attack on the Golan because we're not getting the weapons we need. And Kissinger bought that, or wanted to buy it, I'm not sure which, and started to rant against the Pentagon, saying we've got to get them their weapons because it's screwing up our diplomacy. And at that point, Nixon intervenes. And Kissinger and Schlesinger are still trying to work out a way of doing it. Israel picks up the supplies in Europe, kind of keep it low profile. And Nixon intervenes and says, Henry, if we're going to send three aircraft, we're going to send 300. We're going to just get everything there. And he got angry with Kissinger and Schlesinger and said, just, just do it. And Nixon was very proud of that intervention. And he does deserve credit for it. And that way, Kissinger ended up getting what he wanted because the Israelis started pressing their attack, not just on the Golan, but also in Sinai. And you're right about Sadat was under pressure from the Syrians to launch an offensive. He was not prepared to accept a ceasefire. If he had accepted a ceasefire before the, the American resupply effort started, the Israelis would have accepted it. The Israelis said they were willing to accept a ceasefire at that moment. But Sadat was too confident. And he blew it, and then the whole game changed in, in exactly the way we've been discussing, a way that enabled Israel to have the confidence to take the war across the canal, onto the west bank of the canal, into Africa, as they said, at which point Sadat panicked and went desperately to Moscow and said, I've got to have a ceasefire immediately. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Now we go deeper into the war. Israel is going outside of Cairo, outside of Damascus. Kissinger goes to Moscow to work with the with the Soviets on a ceasefire. I'm trying to see the, the you know how you see that turn again this intersection between the superpower, détente, and each one having their own proxy in, in a regional war that they don't really fully control. How do you see that its significance with the war itself? You know Kissinger in Moscow, and yet the war is going on on the ground. So Kissinger is engaged in a very complicated maneuver. We've talked about one dimension yeah. of that, which is yeah. how he tr was trying to, in effect, control the battlefield to serve his diplomacy. Yeah. But at the same time, he wanted to maintain detente with the Soviet Union, which was a critical element in his overall foreign policy with Nixon. But he also wanted to steal Egypt out of the Soviet pocket. And this had been a long-term objective of his. So he, goes, he flies to, to Moscow to put together the ceasefire because he needed the Russians to press the Egyptians to accept the ceasefire. So he's there the night of the Saturday Saturday night massacre. Uh, That's when, when Nixon when, ordered the firing of uh, of his uh, attorney general um, related to Watergate. Right. So it was the height of Watergate. And there he is negotiating with Brezhnev to cease details of the ceasefire. Yeah. And he discovers very quickly that Brezhnev is desperate for a deal because he knows what the situation is on the ground. He knows right. that the Israelis have crossed the canal right. and are advancing, they thought, right. towards Cairo. And so he was ready to give Kissinger whatever he wanted, direct negotiations between Israel and the Arabs based on 242, no, nothing about what the final borders would be. Right. So they kind of concluded the deal very quickly in a way that Kissinger believed would protect Israel's interests. Because Golda at that stage, Golda Meir, the Prime Minister of Israel, was most interested in getting a direct negotiation. But you had, again, this tension between the United States and Israel because Israel was advancing and Kissinger wanted to basically turn from the battle to the diplomacy. And for that, he needed a ceasefire. And so that their interest diverged at that point. And Kissinger, instead of telling Golda, okay, we got this ceasefire deal. We need you to accept it. There was a communication snafu, or whatever. The Israelis found out about the ceasefire from the radio, not from Kissinger. 
and they were deeply upset. Golda was offended by that, especially because Henry had promised Dinitz that he was going to Moscow to buy them time and they would have at least a couple of more days before there was a ceasefire. And suddenly they were presented with the fait accompli of a US-Soviet ceasefire and they found out about it on the radio. So this was the first first of the crises between Golda and Kissinger. Another one was the encirclement of the Egyptian army in the Sinai. And give the drama of that. On one hand, just a few days earlier, Israel, Dayan is talking about the end of the Third Commonwealth, the end of Israel, and suddenly it's the Egyptians that are encircled. And how important is the Egyptian American or back channel to Kissinger and, and trying to convey intentions? And how does this all play out between Kissinger and Israel at this, at this moment of high drama during a war? The Egyptians opened a back channel to Kissinger at the very beginning of the war. He had had previously that year, 1973, two meetings with his counterpart, the National Security Advisor to Sadat. His name was Hafez Ismail, a distinguished Egyptian diplomat. And it was Hafez Ismail that initiated the channel to Kissinger. And I think, as you mentioned in, in your opening statement, signaled to Kissinger that Egypt's war aims were limited and that they wanted to move from war to a negotiation that would lead to Israel's full withdrawal. But Kissinger knew from the beginning that Sadat did not intend to prosecute the war beyond you know, holding some territory in Sinai. With the negotiation of the ceasefire and Egypt's acceptance of the ceasefire in order to stop the Israeli advance on the west bank of the canal towards Cairo, and by the way, Sadat accepted that ceasefire without coordinating with Assad in Syria, who was extremely upset about it. At that point, the Israelis now felt that their victory was being snatched away from them. And Kissinger flew to Israel. The ceasefire had already gone into effect. Israel and Egypt had both accepted it. So it hadn't gone into effect. It had been passed in the Security Council, but it was supposed to go into effect about 12 hours later. Kissinger arrives in Israel. And here is a fascinating series of conversations with the Israeli cabinet in which Kissinger basically indicates to them that they've got some time to go ahead and finish the job. As a result of that, Brezhnev, Kissinger was in Israel, Brezhnev is convinced that Kissinger had betrayed him, which wasn't that far from the truth. So he now threatens to send in Soviet troops to police the ceasefire. He offers to do it with the United States. This was, in fact, started with Sadat. Sadat invited the superpowers to come in to police the ceasefire. And Brezhnev accepts this and says he's going to send Soviet troops. And that's when Kissinger decides that this is now crossing a red line when it comes to superpower relations. If the Soviets put troops in there, this is going to change the whole equation. It's going to screw up his diplomacy, and he has to stop it. It is it relates to the what we call the DEFCON three the because for in America this was the highest nuclear alert we have been in since the Cuban Missile Crisis, and so what is so dramatic that leads Kissinger to go on nuclear alert? And did is it true that he ordered it and that Nixon was kind of out to lunch, so to speak, because of Watergate and was not really disposed wasn't available at the time, just the circumstances surrounding that. So Kissinger is determined to prevent the Soviets from intervening militarily. And he meets with the National Security Council, with Schlesinger and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and the head of the CIA, Colby. And he talks to Haig, who's the chief of staff at that point. Haig says to him, have you spoken to the president? And Kissinger said, well, I spoke to him earlier, but he was drunk. He doesn't say drunk, but he says something like that. Should I call him? And Haig says, no, leave him, let him sleep. So they get together and decide that the only thing to do in this situation is to send a very clear signal to the Soviets that if they come in, the United States will not accept that. So they decide to move the troops around, recall the B-52 bombing fleet, put their forces on alert in Europe, and say, go to DEFCON 3 for all American forces. Wow. Uh, around the world, wow. which immediately leaks, which I'm not sure that Kissinger expected at the time. But it was designed to send a signal to the Soviets that the United States would not tolerate its intervention. 
Now, people subsequently say that he did this to divert attention from Nixon's Watergate problems. So no, it was, first of all, you've got to understand, Nixon and Kissinger enjoyed moving forces around the map. They did it on a fairly regular basis. Uh, they enjoyed threatening the Soviet Union. And Kissinger, he said to me when in one of the interviews that I did with him, you know, we had to be brutal with them at times. And so this was his way of getting a signal across. Maybe he overdid it, but I think he overdid it because he was concerned at the time that the Soviet Union had seen what was going on with Watergate and believed that there was a crisis of authority in the United States that they could exploit. As it turns out, we know from Dobrynin's memoirs that they really didn't factor that in. But Kissinger at the time thought that that's what was going on. So that was another reason why they had to respond and show that they were ready to stand up to them forcefully. But then Kissinger also had to remove the problem, which was the Israeli surrounding of the Egyptian Third Army. And the intention of the Israelis was to force them to surrender. And that would confound Kissinger's diplomacy, because the idea was to end the war with an equilibrium between the two sides. The Egyptians on the East Bank, the Israelis on the West Bank, a ceasefire that he could come in then and negotiate a disengagement. And the United States would basically lead the diplomatic effort to stabilize the ceasefire. So for that, he had to preserve the Egyptian Third Army. And for that, he had to turn around to the Israelis and say, you've got to stop. You've got to allow the resupply of the Egyptian Third Army because we can't afford to have a superpower crisis because of what you're doing after the ceasefire. My last question is, if you zoom out and say, what is the legacy of the 73 war in terms of the U.S. role in the region, U.S.-Egyptian relations, that it seemed that Kissinger skillfully has brought Sadat into the American orbit through disengagement and the like, away from the Soviet Union. It was a big geopolitical prize. And the U.S.-Israel relationship, which seems to deepen with military assistance that disengagements. And then all this maybe sets the predicate for the Sadat visit in 77. So just if you could summarize for yeah. us, how important is the 73 war? Yeah. So I think it's important to understand that the whole basis of the US-Israel partnership was now thrown out the window. That basis before the 73 war was that the United States would supply Israel with the military means. Israel would deter the Arabs from attacking. The Arabs would become disillusioned, particularly with not being able to get enough support from the Soviet Union to take on Israel, and they would then turn to America. That was the plan, and it was a joint U.S.-Israel strategy worked out when Rabin was ambassador in Washington and Kissinger was national security advisor back in 1972, 73. And Kissinger went out publicly actually as early as 1970, and said the objective was to ensure that Israel, the balance of power was in Israel's favor until such time that Egypt would decide to evict Russian forces and turn to the United States. And he used those words, evict the Russian yeah. forces. And so in 1972, Sadat did that, July 72. But Kissinger was slow to respond, partly because he didn't take Sadat seriously, partly because it was a comfortable status quo. Yeah. And he was negotiating the peace agreement with the Vietnamese at the time. He had a lot of other things going on. Right. So he just let it sit. And that was because Israel's role was to maintain the stability, maintain the status quo. And the United States was supplying Israel with the means to do, to do that. It was all about deterrence. Right. So after the 73, deterrence failed. Right. And Assad attacked. So now they needed a new basis. And the new basis, from Kissinger's point of view, had to be Israeli cooperation in his design to bring Egypt into the American camp through negotiations between Egypt and Israel. The important point that I don't think is fully understood is Kissinger wasn't looking to make peace between Israel and the Arabs. He didn't believe in that. What he believed in was the construction of a new American-led order in the Middle East very much like the order that was created by Metternich and Castlereagh after the Napoleonic Wars. Balance of power. An equilibrium of power right. based on the balance of power that would ensure stability. 
And for that, he had to convince the Israelis that they needed to give up territory, not for peace, but for the order that he was trying to create, and that that was their new role. That was not a role that Golda took to easily. There were these epic arguments between Kissinger and Golda to convince her. And in the end, he convinced her that Israel needed to trade territory for time, that time would relieve them of all the pressures on them, time would create a new situation. And indeed, you know, the Israelis have been trading territory for time ever since. But that was the idea. So that's fascinating. What you're saying is, is that when he started down this road of the two disengagements, 74 and 75, he didn't necessarily say this is phase one and phase two of a grand deal that will emerge that I might not be empowered to see it to its fruition. But you're saying it was more about creating a new equilibrium based on this balance of power. And which then, would stabilize the region under American aegis in which Israel would enjoy respite from war for as long as he could maintain the equilibrium. That was the essence of it. He didn't believe in peace based on his own experience and the experience of, that he'd studied. The subtitle of his book, World Restored, right. which is about Mednick and Kassel, right. talks about the problems of peace. He saw peace as problematic, right. That's not as a great you know, utopia. Order was what he wanted. Order was what he needed in his own life right. after the chaos of the Holocaust that he was right. escaping. But it was an American-led order in which Israel would be protected and would avoid the kinds of wars that had just been through. So you're saying what really is fascinating is often we always think that the reality never reaches the dream. And in this case, the reality exceeded the dream because, indeed, Sadat does have his historic trip. There is the first peace treaty between Egypt and Israel. There's no more interstate wars that you saw plaguing these Arabs and Israelis from 48 to 73. And there hasn't been a shot fired between Egypt and Israel. So this is a case of where the reality exceeded the dream. Anyway, Martin Indyk, I want to thank you so much. This was a fascinating conversation. I can't wait for your book to come out. Henry Kissinger and the Art of the Middle East Deal. What a great headline, great title. And just want to thank you for your time. Thank you, Doug. Always a pleasure. Thank you all very much for listening. I would urge you also to look at the book that Dennis Ross and I wrote called Be Strong and of Good Courage, How Israel's Most Important Leaders Shaped Its Destiny. A lot of declassified material coming both from State Department archives and the archives of Israel. Please go to your favorite podcast app, subscribe, rate, and review, and tell your friends. I want to thank all of those who made this podcast possible. Basha Rosenbaum, Richard Myron and Anouk Millet of Earshot Strategies, Paul Woody Woodhull of District Productive on Capitol Hill, Scott Boxer, Rena Wasserstein, and David Patkin. <laughs>